preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, I apologize, I had to get my props. Uh, this evening, I think it's really a, a lot of fun this evening. You will, I think, learn a lot, be entertained, and have a most extraordinary evening. It has to be, of course, accompanied uh, by a visit to the Museum Modern Art exhibition on Frank Lloyd Wright, and possibly and hopefully the opportunity to visit Falling Water uh, yeah, north of Pittsburgh. It's about an hour's drive north of Pittsburgh. I, met, I first met Edgar Taffel over 30 years ago, and our paths crossed during the mid-60s. And then uh, in 1967, 68, I joined the Metropolitan Museum, and that was the year that Thomas Hoving became director, and I was fortunate in, in being able to join him in that uh, extraordinary institution. And Edgar called me about a year after I joined the museum. He called me and he said, Arthur, meet me at the Stanhope. In 1968 in Tokyo, they did a terrible thing. The only building that survived the great earthquake in the early 20s in Tokyo was Frank Lloyd Wright's majestic Imperial Hotel. Uh, it survived and prevailed, and was, as you know from the exhibition or from any of the books you've read, and perhaps Edgar will show some of it, it was indeed one of the great accomplishments from an architectural point of view, from an engineering point of view, and from a civilization point of view. It survived, and unfortunately, uh, it was a low building on very valuable real estate, so somebody decided to tear it down and build a tall, new imperial hotel. It took place, a little bit of that original Imperial you can find in the rather ugly bar that exists at the Imperial Hotel. But Edgar called me, he said, come to the Stanhope, I have some, an idea. The idea was that the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, if I uh, was successful, would purchase the disassembled Imperial Hotel and then we'd pick and choose and we'd reassemble some of the great rooms, some of the great sculptures, some of the great forms and objects from that uh, from that hotel and salvage and place it in New York City and what a wonderful thing that would be. I quickly ran, left Edgar at the bar, ran across the street, ran up to Hoving's office and I, this extraordinarily brilliant idea fell on deaf ears. Uh, it was, Hoving, who's a wonderful man, read Making the Mummies Dance, Simon & Schuster, a wonderful book in paperback at only $13. Uh, he, he was trained as a medieval scholar, a PhD, had just been installed at the Metro, had just in, been installed at the Metropolitan Museum, where he had previously been a curator of medieval art. And I don't think that this was his most important or highest priority. Nevertheless, we made a good try. Edgar was, of course, disappointed, but that doesn't stop him. About a year and a half later, he said, Arthur, you gotta meet me at the Stanhope. Have I got an idea for you? And he called me and we ran, I, I ran across the street, met him at five o'clock and he said, you know, in Minneapolis, on Lake Minnetonka in Wyzetta, outside Minneapolis, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright house built by Mr. and Mrs. Francis Little. Mrs. Little, I think, had uh, perhaps a liaison with Mr. Wright, but that's another story in another evening. And the little house was completed in 1914, and Mrs. Stevenson, who was the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Little, still resided. She was about 70 plus years old, and she had spent her whole life very cold winters in Minnesota. And the house was very large and primarily heated with fireplaces. It was a cold house. And she had dreamed of living in a French provincial replica. And she built it right next to her Frank Lloyd Wright house with her husband in their mid-70s. The zoning people in the town of Wyzetta said you can't have two houses on a one house zoning plot. So they, uh, they mandated that she tear down either one of the houses. She, of course, wanted to tear down the Frank Lloyd Wright house. The people in Minneapolis, Minnesota were totally unsuccessful in raising the money to take apart, disassemble, and salvage and save the house. Edgar, of course, had vision, and he called me and he said, if the Met bought the house, if you flew out in a week, met with Mr. and Mrs. Stevenson, you could probably buy it for a good price, you get a good contract, you'll take it apart, put it in boxes, you can take part of it to the Metropolitan Museum, you could give part of it to the Minneapolis Museum of Fine Arts, you could, of course, put the brilliant library in Edgar's re newly completed Allentown Art Museum, north of Philadelphia, which, and you can see that too, uh, and there's a portion of it at the Brooklyn Museum. And nevertheless, uh, Hoving, myself, I think John Dinkler, we flew out, to, Edgar came with us to 
show us around, show, show us off. And we made a deal with Mr. and Mrs. Francis, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stevenson. We bought the house for a, a price I will not mention because it will embarrass everyone because you can buy, you, you can't buy a, a studio in Manhattan for that price. Uh, we hired a contractor. It was assembled in New York. It's the, it's the living room from the Francis Little House. It's the music room. Indeed, in, in, in uh, Edgar's addition to the Allentown Art Museum, uh, there's the library. The Minneapolis Museum of Fine Arts has a portion of it. And it is, I think it is, Mrs. Wright, of course, was very upset that the house, one, would disappear and she wouldn't tell everybody where to put the house. Nevertheless, it was successful and I am grateful. I think the museum is grateful to, Frank, to Edgar Taffel uh, for having brought it to the attention and having really been the leader in, in accomplishing what I think is the most important event. I might add that most of the curators in the American wing at the time were not terribly interested since their primary interest was in 17th, 18th, and 19th century art. And they were, they were at first resistant. But I'm so pleased to tell you that now they lecture all over the world and are, and are acclaimed experts on Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Edgar, of course, and I, I, you should read his books. His earlier book, Apprentice to Genius, which is now originally published by McGraw-Hill, is now in a paperback by Dover, and you should get a copy of it. It's a very entertaining book, and it's Edgar's Life with Mr. Wright. But right now, and available in every bookshop at Barnes & Noble B. Dalton, is Edgar's new book about Wright, and it's a, an album of remembrances, including Philip Johnson and a lot of other people you may have heard about. It is a wonderful introduction by Tom Wolfe, who's in the audience this evening, and I'm grateful that he came this evening. And Edgar, of course, spent most of the 30s, from 1932 to 41, as a right hand, as an apprentice to Mr. Wright. He supervised Falling Water, and you'll have the opportunity, I hope, to visit it. He was uh, Mr. Wright's representative in the Johnson's Wax Building, one of the earliest of the what nobody else ever envisioned ever being possible. Uh, you'll know all the stories about the columns and, uh, and the structural uh, integrity, etc. Good story. You'll see it at the Museum of Modern Art. He worked on the Usonian houses, and after World War II, he opened up his office in New York on 11th Street and 5th Avenue. There are some wonderful buildings in New York that he's done. But probably the best one, completed in 1959, is the First Presbyterian Church, church uh, House at 12th Street and 5th Avenue. It's very, very beautiful and very handsome. It's in a landmark district, and I assume and pray that it will be designated a landmark as soon as possible. Did the campus for the State University of Geneseo, and he's always remained in touch with Mr. Wright, the Wright Foundation, serves on the board of many Wright-related, I've probably gone on too long, on very, uh, very many uh, Wright-related activities, and, uh, of course, is the author of this brand new book about Wright, published by John Wiley and Sons. Uh, Edgar Taffel, architect, colleague of Mr. Wright, and probably the only fellow I know in New York, and perhaps outside of New York, who doesn't, give, who doesn't talk about what others have told him, talks about things that he has experienced and witnessed himself. Edgar Taffel. Thank you, Arthur. I uh, told um, him that I was generally like to start off with some kind of a joke to make people laugh, but I said, Arthur, you're going to make this so so somber that um, almost anything will be a relief. So uh, I want you to just notice this tie that I'm wearing, uh, just so that you remember me from Arthur or Bacha Plot. Also, I had to wear it sometime. I brought it back from India a couple of weeks ago. And if you're ever in India, go to the, besides the Taj Mahal, but go to the um, cottage industries. They have a marvelous place, and you, you just don't stop buying there. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. The purpose, the pur real purpose of this talk, I suppose, is to just analyze Frank Lloyd Wright's drawings and the relationship to the buildings. And uh, we'll get into that very soon. And uh, what also, with Arthur starting that off, I wanted to show something about the rooms, not only the room at the Met, but the, concept, the, the sequence of what happened. We don't have any original drawings of the, the house in Minneapolis. And uh, it, 
it's a second house. It originally was born, but built for a uh, right built in Peoria about 10 years earlier, a house for them. And then these people moved up to Minneapolis. So without any further ado, but if you have any questions, please put your hand up. It's hard to see, but speak loudly so that everybody can hear the question and also so that I can hear it. Now up there in the, uh, oh, is that in focus? I guess it is. The purpose of this, really, we're going to, is to just to show the Eastern Seaboard, Chicago, Taliesin in Wisconsin, and up here is Minneapolis. Um, I think, of course, very often I give this talk, and I say Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and this is where the great Beaux Arts system was was brought over. It was imported like all, almost all other American culture. There was an inferiority complex amongst Americans. And it wasn't until around Chicago that a group of architects found out that there ought to be an indigenous kind of architecture, not necessarily what was taught here. When you sent your son to Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and he graduated, he would get, then go over to Europe and learn how all about wine and cheese and that sort of thing and go to the bazaar and bring back the books and then copy from the books. So, but this is not exactly the way uh, it happened. So what we'll do is we'll start off and show you the plan of the little house. There is a lake up in here. And this is a, 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 a country situation. And the house goes from right to left. This is a big screen porch, a large living room, another living room, entryway, which is part of the living room, and the red spot is the, is the library. And the bedrooms are here, here, here. I could never figure this plan out. Mr. Wright never told us anything about it. But this bedroom is big. You see how big it is in relationship to all of this. This bedroom is about 40 feet long, but, I mean living room, but it was basically a concert room. The Littles also had a house in town, so this was a summer house and weekend house. But I could never figure out why. His bed was here, and her bed was over here. And then they shared this bathroom right over in here. Anyhow, the, um, when it was all arranged later, I arranged for this to go to the Allentown Art Museum. What happened was that after talking it over with Arthur and, and, uh, uh, and Hoving, it was, they told me to go out with the two and, and go out and see the house. And we brought to along two curators. Both one of them was a real expert in, in, uh, patchwork quilts. And the other had just graduated from, from, uh, uh, preservation school. But this is the gloomy entrance as it was. The story about bringing them up and all that is, was quite, was quite, it was a gloomy day. It was a gloomy way in, in many ways. And they weren't interested in, in this house at all. One was, this was just before Thanksgiving, one was going to Des Moines, and the other one was going for the long weekend to Boston. So that when we got through showing them the house, we took them back to the airport, and one got a, a bus to Des Moines, and the other got his plane back the other way. So if we go a little bit further and onto the right side, this is the screen porch that they lived in. Of course, there was no air conditioning. And from that is the view of the lake. Well, this is the entrance, I'm sorry. And here's the view of the lake from that port. Tom Hoving had said that he had spent the summer on that lake, and that was the fort one of the fortuitous things that had happened, that he knew the house, and he said to Arthur, go and get it. And this was part of the process. Looking back as to where we came from, the driveway was way, way down in here, and you came all the way up into here. The, uh, what I did not show you was the kitchen and the dining room were in the lower floor, and it was said that both Mrs. Little and her daughter had never cooked more than one egg at one time in their lives. This is the entranceway, and th that is the little library. And this slide shows you that when we went there, the bricks were here for that second house. They were choosing the bricks up for what they would have. Here is the big living room, where it's tied behind, but to keep the roof from falling out, there's a big lighting light thing. And I was there only last week, and somebody has not told the docents about it. The docents all say that this is a skylight, but it is not. 
Every idea, every building of Frank Lloyd Wright's that was good, or anybody else's, has a great idea. And Wright wrote early on, well, Sullivan wrote a book called The Autobiography of an Idea, and in Wright's writing, somewhere there it says, love of an idea is the love of God. And the idea of this room was, see the clear stories are within the outer wall, and you get that reflection of on, onto the ceiling. And there's a light system of lighting that goes all the way around. These are the two curators. And before, in the airplane and on the way out, they just never said anything. And I thought they were not at all interested. They wouldn't be interested. But the moment we walked into them, one of them said, looked around, he said, we must have this house no matter what it costs. So uh, this, um, when I show these sli this slide in, in, uh, in England, I point out here, and this is what the British called moisture penetration. <laughs> That's the ceiling. And um, this is a look-see that was still a foggy day, but this was the first and probably only time that Mr. Wright, see, I still call him Mr. Wright, uh, he designed the stained glass so that the design starts here hard, here, and then just this line through. There was some correspondence about his first design. Um, Little said that he came up here, there was too much color in the glass. He had come up here to look at the lake he didn't come up here to look at the stained glass, so Wright changed it. And from the downstairs level, see the change, there's a change, but at the end of that day that we were there, the sun became, began to come out. And that was the view. When you are at the Met, you have no idea whatsoever about what side does what and what side of the room does the other. They all could put a mural on one side to show you this view and a garden or something on the other side. But museums have a very way, strange way. They are accustomed to thinking in terms of paintings. And a room is a painting. It's either Louis XIV's, or in this case, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright one. But they never think of a, a room having a relationship with outside, with other rooms. It's just a painting, as I said before. So as I left that more that day, the sun came out, and I knew that Daddy Frank was on our side. This is the Allentown Art Museum, which is only 90 miles from New York. This was a Presbyterian church, and I got the job to add to it. The main gallery is from here to there. And we have, this is the original shot that I took in Minneapolis of that room that's in, in the uh, Allentown Art Museum. And the fascinating thing about it is the stained glass windows, when the sun hits, reflect onto the floor. This is the library. That was my coat the day I was out there. Something very strange about this library. Not, none of the shelves are any higher than eight inches. So any book they had would have to be eight inches or shorter. And that is the position that it is in. Um, I had copied right uh, rooms from the Martin House in Buffalo and uh, had some chairs made. And I designed a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, coffee table. They really weren't any coffee tables in those olden days. Coffee table is something that happened probably at, they call it a, co a cocktail table. And that's really the spirit of the room. Now we will go on to the regular part. The only reason I added this was that was author was so kind to come. And uh, oh, I guess I turn this on to. We're having trouble with the Parthenon. One building that Mr. Wright used to tell us he really disliked was the Parthenon. <laughs> and the reason he disliked the Parthenon was that his, the Greeks originally did their temples and buildings in wood. And the reason that these columns were small, bigger at the bottom and smaller at the top was what what they later in the Beaux-Arts called enthesis, which gets it smaller and smaller. And there are all kinds of stuff we had to study in, in architectural history, that the end columns were a little bit wider than the others because you would see through and it makes them look smaller. Also, that the Parthenon uh, had a, 
and uh, that this is not exactly straight. It comes up and goes down so that it looks straight. But the Greeks originally did it in wood and they painted their buildings in bright colors. Later, when they got more affluent, they, they copied them in stone and painted them in the bright colors. When we had our Greek revival, we didn't know that they were painted in bright colors, and we built them in wood because we couldn't afford the stone, and we painted them white the way they were, we thought they were. So we'll go on from here. I want to show you some of my own work because I feel that I am not, I must tell you there, I'm not a, an academic, I'm not a critic. I wanted to be an architect since I was eight years old when I worked with, played with Freudel blocks. People came around and he said, oh, he's going to be an architect. And somehow it just stayed on. Hey, what happened? We blew it out. Murphy's Law. Anybody up there in the projection booth? Any questions? <laughs> Who owns what? Oh, um, the Kaufman seniors gave the house to their son when they passed away. And Edgar Jr. decided in 1963 that he did not want to live in Pittsburgh or there. And, <coughs> and he thought it should go into the public domain. And he did a very, very wise thing. He did not give it to the state, the county, or a museum, or the government. He gave it to a conservancy. No, oh, now we're on. Uh, I was in Portugal a few years ago, and I found out why the Portuguese lost their empire. <laughs> they, then I was in England not long after, and I noticed the British had just put a, a door in, and they knew what, where to stay and then if I you know, come back to this country, just at the end of the um, Queen's Tunnel, there's a, a, a church that has an arch, and it has these two little strange arches within it. So this is the end of the arch thing. Then uh, friends of mine are here tonight who uh, live in Sicily, and on the way back a couple of years ago, in Rome, I saw this, this lovely little church and a, and a lovely little square, and... Uh, I wonder what would happen if this were in New York and our Landmarks Commission decided that this has really got to be saved. When you look at the other side of this from my hotel room, look, this is all a facade. It's a big, big, look, it's a big, big fake, the whole thing. So we'll jump to Washington Square, Greenwich Village, and uh, I came back from the service and I decided to start, have my practice here and my life here and I had a little apartment here and there and in 1950 I bought this house and planted a tree now it's up to here now that damn tree is so big it's scratching the paint off of everything um, I have a photograph now coming up which is present owner at the age of two months and this is the living room I stripped this wall but kept the basic 1856 of the house, and looking out the back. Um, while I was at Taliesin, uh, the Christmas, every Christmas, Mr. Wright would, if you stayed and didn't go home, he would give each apprentice a Japanese print. And I have several here on this wall. What he would do would be to uh, set, we would all come in and say if there were 10 of us, we would be invited into the drafting room, and he would have taken out, say, 15 prints and we would draw straws. And then we would choose, starting with the smallest going on. And then he would tell what each print was, and he would write a little message, Merry Christmas, to Edgar or whoever, wherever it was. Uh, then the reason he had more than the 10 was that those at the end wouldn't feel that they got the leftover ones. Now, if you look out the backyard, there's a piece of sculpture here. A lot of people ask what the sculpture is, and I tell them that uh, it, the title of it is Metal Fatigue. 
uh, there was a big storm and a piece of cornice fell off into my yard and I took the cornice and I painted it red and stuck it in the ground. A lot of people think this is real sculpture, you know. <laughs> right around the corner is the First Presbyterian Church and I got the... I want to thank God for the Bauhaus, which Tom Wolfe wrote so well about. A Bauhaus architect had this job first and he brought the plans to the church people and it was all steel and glass. And when one of the ministers asked him if he couldn't do something more in keeping, this architect who is nameless said, I will be the art, do the architecture and you do the ministry. And fortunately, he got fired. So I have the details of the, the, the catrafoils and the building matches. In 1846, when this building was built, they had no idea that they would ever need for a religious complex, a fellowship hall, which is in the basement, offices, a big, pl a big uh, uh, room to meet on Sunday, and three floors of classrooms. That is the big meeting room where people come in after, on, on Sunday morning for the coffee hour and look out onto the Fifth Avenue. And the Walden School, my alma mater, had me do this addition to that building. Then they sold this building and built a big high rise, and then they went busted. Not on account of my building. I did the, the chapel, Protestant chapel at Kennedy Airport. The, the Catholic chapel is here. And the, this is the first time I came into real, real bureaucracy. The Port Authority owned the land, and Wally Harrison of Harrison and Brownvis was the arbiter of aesthetics. He decided that all the buildings would be white, that they would be 16 feet to here and 45 feet to there. Uh, we had a limited budget of exactly a half a million dollars, so I did the building in wood. Fortunately, it came in on, under the budget. It didn't leak. There's always this story about Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings leak. By the way, the, the bulletin, the, the show at MoMA is fantastic. They have a catalog that is very handsomely done, and they have five people wrote the uh, five different articles describing what the show and Frank Lloyd Wright is all about. And I know I read through the other night, read all firm, and I went back to the first one. And this man has written 20 pages of description, and in 20 pages he has mentioned leaky roofs 15 times. <laughs> that is the interior. I did a community college upstate, I did two of them. And this is Fulton Montgomery Community College, all natural materials. And I was there recently, the building is 20 years old, and the brick and the lead-coated copper and the stone are all, and the, and the, the limestone and, the real, and, the, and a real slate roof, they are just as good today as they were when it was put up. That's the library. I also did a fine arts building for a state college. That's the theater, lead-coated copper again. I snuck in artwork. Imagine sneaking in artwork in a fine arts building. It wasn't, wasn't allowed, you know. But this is stained glass that goes through at the end of two corridors. A barn in Pennsylvania and the original house, and I think I kept the spirit in Pennsylvania Dutch. That's the lower floor. And that fireplace got it published in Life magazine. It proves if you want your work published in this country, you don't necessarily have to do something that's sensible, realistic, and within the budget. You have to do something that the editors think is a real smasheroo, whether it fits the program or not. And most, many, 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 many architects understand this very, 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 very well. Do something that is and the magazines have to do something new every month. End of sermon. This is our only Louis Sullivan building in New York, and I had the fortune of, of uh, doing the lobby and this up in here. How do you get a job like that? Well, it's a funny and interesting one. A contractor bid on the original plans, and the plans were so bad that he went to the owner and he said, what you need is not bidding on it, but you need a good architect. And he told, told him about me, and I got the job. Strange. 
I don't know how he went about firing the other architect. Uh, we had no record whatsoever of what the lobby was. So I took the medallions out of the stair and had to keep the floor and added to it. And this is detailed from a cornice upstairs. And Louis Sullivan did bank buildings with skylights. And I emulated that. At this point, I never know where to, how to stop this, this and go on to Frank Lloyd Wright. So I, well, I show sketches. This is a sketch for a, a, uh, a monastery up in near, beyond Peekskill. And, uh, I went up to the de for Tibetan monks. I went up to their dedication of the land. They, here they are. We're dedicating the land. They had a, they had a porter sand out here. And the sign says, Lamas only. <laughs> so we go east. We're going far east. And three weeks ago, guess what I shot? And see what's over here? These are oxen, bulls, pulling the, the lawnmower. This building was done by a man who was in love deeply with a woman, and she died unexpectedly and too soon. And this is the Taj Mahal, the love of a man for a woman. Of course, he had a harem. This was the best lady of the, of the group. <laughs> but I noticed that, uh, gee, wouldn't, look at this ornament. Wouldn't Louis Sullivan go wild about it? Just beautiful. But we're here tonight to talk about a certain man, and these are some shots I took at a picnic. He dressed beautifully, he walked beautifully, he spoke beautifully. And this part is the cover of my book right there. Autobiography of an idea, love of an idea is the love of God. Every drawing that came out of Taliesin during my period had to have a red square with his initials. And uh, that was holier than anything, except that very too often I would have to get a drawing, drawing out to the job. I learned very quickly that the best way to learn about architecture was to not only make the perspective pretty drawing, but get into the real nuts and bolts of it and get into getting the buildings built. So I would come back for a weekend, make a drawing that was necessary, and even before it was finished, I would put a red square there, waiting for his, and he couldn't go buy a red square without putting his initials on it. <laughs> uh, I'm talking to the, the mechanical department here. I trust, I'm, oh yeah. Since uh, we're going to be talking about drawings, I, I arranged to get, these are what I call Boughton renderings. There is a process in architecture, and that is first to get the job. Then there are various phases. There is schematic design development. After the schematic drawings are approved by the owner, you go to the next phase where you select the materials, you check everything all around, and the next phase and, uh, is construction documents and the next phase, which you use those for bidding purposes, and then finally the architect is as supervision. Very often the owner doesn't need the architect for supervision or the bidding, so he stops there. But there are companies all over the place and artists who make these drawings, and they're made under tremendous pressure because a certain date is set, and you have to have these pretty drawings, and you sell the job to your client with these drawings. And I got these from an outfit in Cleveland who does this for people all over the United States. And they have a staff, we understand. There are certain men that do clouds. There are certain men that do the luggage, the uh, foliage. Others do the automobiles. Others do the cars. And there are others that do the shadows, and the others that do the building. Now, I had a tremendous experience with one of these one time we were doing his job for the dormitory authority of the state of New York and we were given a time to be there and only two days before we got our renderer and he worked day and night and the night before we were going up he had this this rendering made now these are also made so that when they are photographed and reduced to postage stamp size or a little bit thing like this they can put it in the paper and get publicity right away well the night before we were to drive to Albany and present this. We, this rendering came in, and it was awful. 
It was all screaming colors. It was just terrible. And my associates all said, we cannot show this. And I said, we, we've got to show it. Let's show it and make excuses for it immediately. Well, it was a big fight. We took a vote and we went up. And the next morning at 10 o'clock, we we're in Albany. And we then in comes the head of the dormitory authority. And I said, uh, sir, uh, we have to make an excuse for this, but let me show you what the excuse is going to be. And I put this, draw, this big rendering up. It was a colossal thing. He took one look at it and he said, Mr. Taffel, that's wonderful. That's the best rendering we've ever had. And he called to an associate and said, see that that gets framed and put in the entrance. So. Just a little about my, my own background. This is 175 West 76th Street, and uh, I went through high school, and we lived here for a while. In New York, you always move, rather it's easier to move. Then we moved to the 10th floor, and then we moved to the penthouse, and with the crash, my folks moved out into the country and lived with relatives for a while. But I would go from here to NYU School of Architecture, go to 72nd Street, get the express to Times Square, get the shuttle to go to Grand Central, and walk over to 2nd Avenue. There was an, an elevated train here. NYU's architectural school was on the 12th and 13th floor of this building. And there, why? And one of the reasons I think they had it there was that they could get a lot of architectural help, professors and all that, to turn out the work that they and teach. And one of the things, this was the Bozar School, and they needed, in order to get students from all over, they needed to win prizes. And there were times when we would watch, at a certain point, the professor would come in, they'd push the, push the student apart, and they would do the designing, and they would do the, the, all the work on it. But that's exactly the time when the Museum of Modern Art was started by Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson and that other man. And this is the building where they got their place. This is the Heckscher Building, now called the Crown Building. Many of us students came over to see that first show of modern architecture. And in it was, oh, we also went up to the the uh, Rorick Museum, Nicholas Rorick, and Henry Russell Hitchcock gave a lecture there on modern architecture. And this building was very modern for that time. It was done by Sugarman and Berger. I don't know wh who they were or what, but I just went and looked it up. But it had corner windows. And Henry Russell Hitchcock gave a talk on modern architecture. And he kept saying what the cliches are about modern architecture. The corner window, the uh, flat roofs, the this and that. And then back at NYU, for the next weeks coming, fellows would be working and designing something, and then they'd stop me out. Cliche! That's when Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography came out. And that, reading that, is really what got me. At the same time, look at this as a piece of art. Uh, he designed it himself. The Museum of Modern Art put out a book on their show. That's handsome, isn't it? Um, I wrote to Frank Lloyd Wright, and this is the telegram that he sent to me. Uh, at first, I used to say it was collect until I found out that I asked him to send it to collect. Edgar A. Tassell. It's the F never comes across in that in phoned in. I found out much later that he didn't have a charge account at the railroad station to send telegrams, but he could send them collect, so it was much easier. And he would telephone the, the telegrams in. He says, believe we can manage a fellowship for you now uh, if you can come into to temporary quarters, if you like. Uh, my re re respects to Percival Goodman, Frank Lloyd Wright. Percival Goodman was a young architect in the city, and I went to him and asked him. All the others had said, don't go, wait till he's accredited. But per I said, "What, well, Mr. Goodman, what would you do if you were me? And he said, if I were you, I wouldn't ask. If I had the opportunity, I would go. So I went. That's the map, and I showed it before. I took a bus for 17 hours to Chicago and a bus from there up to Spring Green. If you come to see my next show, which will be in Oak Park on the 16th of next month, uh, you will see downtown Spring Green. But it was only four or 500 population at the time. This is a map or a plan of Taliesin. 14, well, let's see, it's 440 feet from one end of it to the other. It starts with his own living space 
a blozier living, the drafting room, the draftsman's place, the kitchen and help, uh, the stables here, and ice house, and uh, root cellar, chicken coop, and pig pen. When, when he first built this place, he drove up, you drove up in through here and right through the middle because most of the driving in 1914 was still automobile. He built this place for himself and the lady he, whom he was in love with, which was not his wife. He had been married before. He didn't have a divorce. His wife wouldn't give him a divorce. Later, oh, oh yeah, and as you probably know, 1914, he built this in 1911. 1914, when he was away, a uh, workman who was a fundamentalist religious fanatic from Barbados burned the house and his lady love, her two children, and four people were killed in it. Later, in Taliesin II, the road came around this way, and later on, while I was there, we took that road out and put, put, the, put a parking space and the roads here, because it's just too noisy. This is a drawing of Taliesin number one, where the road came right up into the middle of it all, and for what reason he made this, I do not know. Later, the road, as I said, came around this side. From the air, this is the Wisconsin River, and we had a hydroelectric plant. At dusk, somebody would go down, one of us was chosen to do that for a week or so, and you would open up the valve, and that would start up the electricity. Then at about 10 o'clock, you'd go down and turn it back down. From Mr. Wright's bedroom, he saw nothing but a stream, a little stream. So by the time I came there, we built this dam. It didn't do anything but gave him a view of water. The family chapel was here. When the Johnson Wax Building came around and he got some real money, he bought the farm across the way so that all of this came into his domain. From his own office, this is the view of the living room that you saw before, and this, these, this is the stairway entrance. And this is a photograph taken from a postcard right after the fire. And the smoke was still coming the next day out. That's all the smoke. And this is, a, this is Wright himself. He came up from Chicago. That's the living room. If you are ever within 100 miles, don't miss it. They now, since Mrs. late Mrs. Wright passed away, they now show you through there. And it is the greatest room greatest room I've ever been in. Look at these little staccato windows up here. In the wintertime, when the sun is low, the streak light streaks across. In the summertime, the light comes down through here. There's a balcony looking at the fireplace. He designed a quartet strand, and that's the drafting room. That was the center of everything. He would get an idea and come into the drafting room. My table was right here. Jack Howe was right here. Bob Mosier was here. And you'd put your pencil down and look up, you'd see a Japanese screen. We never oiled the hinges in the entrance so that because the hinges did squeak, he never knew this either. Because when it squeaked, we thought he might be coming, so we would look busy. There was a fireplace, and in a drafting room, men intend to crowd around each other and talk and yak. Whoops, what happened? Uh-uh. Oh. This is a shot that Pete Guerrero took later years, and if you are over near MoMA, go across the street to the Deutsche building, or the German building, and there's an exhibition of Pete's work there. A book of his photographs on Frank Lloyd Wright has just come out, and it's a beautiful and a handsome book. Pete tells this story, and I think it's worth repeating, that uh, he came back years later and t told Mr. Wright that he'd like to take a photograph of him, and uh, Mr. Wright said, well, Pete, go out and take pictures and come back a little later. And Pete came back and he said, Mr. Wright, I only have two negatives left, uh, and Mr. Wright said, just a minute. And Mr. Wright then got a pencil and a, 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 a knife, and he took, took them in, he took his glasses off, his glasses are down here, and fixed his tie, 
He wore beautiful clothes and he had them always made, made to his design. He didn't want his clothes to be British. He didn't want it to be part of English, that culture. And he did what he always showed us, is how you sharpen a pencil. And you pull the knife toward you as you turn the, turn the pencil around. This on the other side is the fireplace with a uh, other side of the, the drafting room and a portrait of his, wife, of his mother here. And here is a bench. Very often he would work for an hour or so and then he'd go over there and lie down and fall asleep and sleep for 20 minutes, a half hour or so, get up, shake himself and then come on back and go to work. He had one photograph of, of another building that he didn't design in the whole place. And that is in Lahasa, the potala of the, and I always wondered why, why did he have this? With one exception, the, see this is a temple and it's a place for all the, 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 the monks to live. But the way it spills down, oh they started building it way down at the bottom of the hill. He did a house in Usonia that is quite like that. The, 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 uh, there's no water, but down for the first maybe 30 or 40 feet is a wall coming up to the house. Um, that house was done for Saul Friedman, who had two music stores. And I understand that it ran when the budget was $35, $35,000. When they'd reached the top and ready to put the house on, they had spent $35,000 on that wall. Well, Friedman didn't go broke yet. He uh, borrowed money and borrowed money, and he finally got the house built. And Mr. Wright came by to have the final checking up, and he put his arm around and said, Saul, isn't this a great country we live in where a small businessman like yourself can afford to have a beautiful house like this? <laughs> this is the Larkin Building in Buffalo that he designed in 1902, and there are several renderings of it. At one as a, um, a th this is a horse and buggy, and another one I saw, I think the one at the Met at uh, at MoMA has a um, has a streetcar. I'm probably the only person around that went to that building with Mr. Wright on a trip to Falling Water with two other apprentices. I wrote about it in the first book. We got down around Chicago, and Mr. Wright said, let's go to Buffalo. I said, Mr. Wright, Buffalo's way up there, and we're going down to Pittsburgh. He said, yes, but I want to see the Larkin buildings. Uh, there, it was torn down in 1950. The Larkin building was one of the first companies to, um, in the, in the uh, uh, they were like Sears, Roebuck, and Montgomery Ward, the mail order business, and they also produced soap. It was the Larkin Soap Company. And... Uh, for the strange, marvelous thing, we just popped in and telephone went over and we had lunch with the Larkin Juniors. And uh, by this time, they were hardly using the building. There are no photographs of this taken later years. There are no, as far as we know, no, f no color shots taken of it. These are from a German publication. Oh, look, very much like the Sullivan skyline. That was one of the first buildings that was air conditioned. It had uh, electricity lighting all over. The women, one of the first building uh, companies that engaged women, and you see they all wear white blouses. He took us through this building. It was a fantastic to be shown by him and telling us all about what was done here and what was done there and all the problems he had. And we walked down through this stair, but these women were not dressed that way. This is a return air duct. Instead of it just being a grill, he left out alternate bricks. At this is the point where he said uh, he wanted to show us the wall hung water closet that he had designed. Up until this point, toilets were always on the floor, but he wanted one that you could wash out underneath it. And uh, he said, follow me. So we followed him, and we went down to the basement, and the first door that we came to, he had a sign on it, it said, ladies. And he pushed the door open with his cane, and we walked in, and there must have been 15 women, and they saw these four men come in, and they screamed and yelled and ran out. He didn't, he went right to it, and he pointed. He said, there it is, the first wall-hung water closet. We went to the Martin house, and he was the general manager of the company. 
And the plan, I show this because Mr. for years he had this plan. He loved this plan. And that was up on one of the walls in the drafting room. Uh, the house was sold to, uh, at one time to, uh, to a Catholic group, and then it was sold to an architect, and he tore the back part of it out, sold this house, and he put three apartment houses in here, two-story. It was awful. The State, <coughs> State University of New York bought it, and I did a remodeling job on it, the first one. We had two phases of $30,000 each. Last year, they hired a professional preservationist architectural firm in Chicago, and they did a volume, all that. They spent $85,000 on it. They want to bring it back to its original, and they want to spend eight, they want to spend four and a half million dollars. But this is all the original furniture. The stained glass. It's a terrible shot, but it's the Unity Church in Oak Park that he did just after this was done. That is the sanctuary, and this is the, that part on the right is the rest of it. Now, across the street is a Catholic, typical Catholic church. This street had streetcars and trucks and buses and all that sort of thing, so he made the entrance around here. You come into the sanctuary. And the, you drop your children off here, or you go here, and that is entirely separate. And there's the fellowship hall and classrooms. It's a universalist church, all poured concrete. And this is a split plan, so this half is different from this half. They did not know very much about poured concrete. The reinforcing on these cantilevers is on the wrong side of the slab. All concrete is, is porous, and moisture gets in it. That is a sanctuary. There is the, the, where the minister is, and this is a place to hide the organ pipes. And this is all stained glass, and the whole ceiling is, is like coffers with stained glass, colored glass in it. These are light fixtures hanging down. That's the fellowship hall also with lights from the top. This is a real typical kind of perspective sketch that Wright worked on all by himself. He might have had a draftsman lay out the perspective, but then he goes along. But by this time, the building has been designed. This is a Boughton rendering, 1923. There was a man in Chicago who did a lot of rendering for him. This is a mostly steel and glass skyscraper done for an insurance company, 1923. And there was a crash in 1923. And that was one of those, like all architects, we, we get hurt just before the crash, and it takes a long time to get back in. For the hell of it, in the late 50s, he designed a mile-high building, and it got him a lot of publicity. That's about all. But there is a model of this at, at MoMA, a fantastic model. They never stopped to worry about where you would put the automobiles when you would put this 150-floor this, uh, building. He designed in 19, at the, just before 1929, an apartment complex of three buildings down on, on uh, St. Mark's Church, St. Mark's in the Bowery. And he tried, while I was with him, to take a group of these buildings in Washington and make it into a complex. And uh, it never went ahead. One day in the drafting room, he asked me to help him pull something out of a drawer. And uh, we pulled it out looking for a certain project, and he pulled out a drawing that was about so big, and he, he uh, folded it. There's a fold that goes right here, and he threw it on the floor, and I said, uh, Mr. Wright, may I have it? And he said, sure, take it. And uh, I took it then to my room, and this is the plan of a barge here. And down here is a red square, and it says, "Good, the good ship lollipop. This is an elevation of the looking at it this way. There are balloons all along here, and these are the balloons here. And then looking the opposite way, there are these are the balloons. You look at it that way, and these are the other balloons here. 
the only drawing I have of it. We had a wonderful draftsman, draft, uh, uh, not a draftsman, he's an architect, Yen Liang, who was a tallyist when I arrived, and uh, he was from China, and he made this drawing. And this was the original Hillside Home School with another building here and another little building here. And this was the drawing that was sent out in the brochure. We all assumed that all these things were being built, but they weren't built until we built them. This is the drafting room. Yen went on and uh, he, has, he did a piece for me in my second book and it's a wow, it's just great. Yen wrote a piece, Wes Peters, Mr. Wright became son-in-law, came from a newspaper background. His father owned the Indianapolis, not in the, Evansville, Indiana Press. It was a Scripps Howard Press. And Wes grew up with newspaper all around, and he would put up, work out with a couple of us, a newspaper that we would put up every, say, every couple of weeks. When I arrived, there was a story there of uh, visitors, who the visitors had been the last week. And it said, uh, two gentlemen came from New York. One is Henry Russell Hitchcock, and the other was Philip Johnson. And then it said, uh, Mr. Johnson wore lavender trousers, a light blue shirt, and so on and so on. And then it told what Mr. Hitchcock wore, and that's all it said about them. <laughs> then Yen wrote a piece. Mrs. Wright had a dog by the name of Wolf. Russia, a, uh, a German wolfhound, yeah, and uh, that that wolf would go and chase the sheep, and sheep have a strange respiratory system. They uh, can run like fury, and then all of a sudden they fall over and die, and several of the sheep were, were killed that way, and uh, everybody was blaming the dog, and Mrs. Wright said no, it, her dog wouldn't do a thing like that. So Yen wrote a poem about that wolf the dog had written, and it said, I don't chase, he had trouble with the plural of English from the Chinese, I don't chase sheeps, sheeps chases me. <laughs> this is the big drafting room that we built. When I arrived, the floor was just being, being put there, oh, back here. When I arrived also, up here was a, a, uh, a, a, uh, well, it was a big sawmill, and lo logs were brought in. We were brought out and cut, helped cut those logs. They were brought in, and we put on the on on this big mill, and uh, the slabs would be cut, and the the leftover pieces of wood were what we used for the boiler rooms. Then uh, we made these trusses, and Mr. Wright designed the draft of the tables, and we made one and checked it out. That's me in the drafting room. I had a lot of hair. In there. And oh, Henry Russell Hitchcock came out to visit. And uh, I, two of us were, were to help Mr. Wright get drawings and we brought him around. And he was writing a book called uh, The Nature of Materials at the time. And he and Henry Rus and Philip Johnson were still uh, connected with the Museum of Modern Art. And what, just to make conversation one day, Mr. Wright said, uh, uh, oh, Henry Russell, how is Philip? And uh, Hitchcock had one of those fake, he was from the Middle West somewhere, but he had a fake Boston accent. And he would say, uh, 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 Mr. Wright, uh, he's, he's rather fine, yeah, Philip is fine. Yeah. And then Mr. Wright said, uh, do you and he differ in matters of aesthetics? And Henry Russell said, oh, oh, oh yes, we, yes, we do. Uh, Philip is partial to line, and I'm partial to surface. <laughs> then this is the famous picture taken for the 1938 architectural forum. Fellas in my office used to call this the Iwo Jima shot. <laughs> Here's Wes Peters and myself and Bob Mosher and Mr. Wright and John Lautner. Bob went out, finally went over to Spain and lived in Marbella and built lots of interesting houses. This is a house in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. We, we completed a set of working drawings for it and one day and then Mr. Wright said, Edgar, always pronounce it Edgar, Edgar get six sets of plans and go up to, go up to Two Rivers and build the house. So I had six sets of plans made and I went up and I would 
make this circuit, go up there and stay overnight and then come go to the Johnson building and come, you know, it was just going. And this is a shot that I took when it, the house was at this point. This was my automobile. And I gave it to him, showed it to him to show him the progress. And what did he do? He grabbed a pencil. He couldn't bend a bear. And look, he put, that's the same shot. He put this foliage all around it. Look, you can come back a second. It's bare, absolutely. He couldn't let go of a pencil either. This is a photograph that somebody took, I don't know, is it? This is Edgar Kaufman Jr., who was an apprentice, Mr. Wright and myself, and I'm holding Mr. Wright's cane for some reason or other. This is a house, this drawing was made when I arrived at Taliesin, and the working drawings were almost finished. And this is a house in Minneapolis looking out over the Mississippi River. And uh, when the bids came in shortly after, of course, they came in double the budget. So Mr. Wright made some little doodles and immediately redrew, and he designed a one-story house. And we made, that was the first job I ever worked on. There were three or four of us working on the plans. The fascinating thing about it was that all the bricks were, every other brick, they had two colors of brick going all the way through. I detailed this fireplace, and Yen and I drove up to see the house when it was just framed up. And we walked in, and we're looking around, the contractor came in, and he said, whoever had made them drawings of the fireplace didn't know what the hell he was doing. He said, I had to tear it down twice. Whatever he drew was wrong, and it dawned on me, and I learned a lesson. Whatever you put down has got to be so done that it can be interpreted by a third party in another place in another time. Well, that was one of the, one of the drawings. I assume that you know that Cop Mr. Wright was in the drafting room when Kaufman called, and, and Mr. Wright, uh, Kaufman had called several days before, but the last call was from Minneapolis, and Mr. Had, Wright hadn't started to draw anything, and it was 140 miles away, and Mr. Wright said, come on, EJ, and we're, we're ready for you. And uh, Kaufman, now that's, these are not, this drawing was made a little later, but uh, there was only Bob Mosier and myself and Mr. Wright, and Mr. Wright sat down and started to draw. He drew the first floor plan, the second, the third floor plan, elevation, a section through it, another elevation, what I said, that took all the time, and he put a title across the bottom. And just at that moment, Mr. Wright's secretary walked in the door of that draft, and he said, Mr. Wright, this Mr. Kaufman is here. And Mr. Wright, Kaufman came along, and Mr. Wright put the pencil down, he walked out, got up, and he walked toward Kaufman, and he said, welcome, E.J., we've been waiting for you. And he took him around, and he showed him the plan, the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, and this elevation. And I'd never heard or seen him operate. The drawing is what we're talking about, is the instrument. The instrument that the architect shows after the ideas come, and he then brings the client into his way, what it's all about. Um, to further that story, we just at some point or other, someone came along and said, Mr. Wright, lunch is ready, and they went up for lunch. And I looked at Bob, and Bob looked at me, what do we do now? So I said, well, why don't you draw that west elevation, I'll do the east elevation. So in his way, we, we started drawing, and we erased things, we put the colors, and we erased it. And we worked for about an hour, and they came back down, and we had the drawings there, and I thought we'd get fired or something. Mr. Wright said, and E.J., here's the east elevation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Kaufman went away, and then for about 10 days, we made beautiful drawings. And this is the one that Bob laid this one out. It tells the story of it. Right here is the living room is right up in there. There's a big rock, and, and the trees go through here. Everything was. Uh, we had the plot plan. And... Uh, Oh, uh, last year I was in Florida in a, in a second-hand store, and there they had a, a big um, lithograph. And um, look what it is. 
everything is wrong. Um, and see, here, here are the bolsters that hold it up, and there is the bridge over here. Uh, he doesn't have the top floor, he missed that. And this balcony that goes from here to here, he's got it going all the way out, out to there. I'm giving the, you know, bridge, uh, I'm giving the original of this to the Falling Water Conservancy. So we made the drawings, we got a builder, and, and uh, here the building is under construction. There are those bolsters. And uh, Bob start, took the building from there up to a little bit further. The quarry was right up in here. We had a stone boat, a little tractor to pull us down. And we put the stone. Uh, this is the shot I took later when I came onto the job. Well, I, well, that, uh, I did this part and this whole balcony that stands out here. And then the, the interiors, the fireplaces. And Bob came back to finish it up. I wish I'd taken this shot. There are the rocks. Then we got the Johnson Wax Building. How do you get a job? If it hadn't been for Edgar Kaufman Jr. coming to be an apprentice and his family coming out and visiting, and on a Sunday night, we were all in the living room, and Mr. Wright started to talk about, he would, Sunday night, we would all get dressed up, and uh, we would have sort of a picnic dinner, after which we would, I would play the piano, and Mr. Wright's secretary would sing, and we had a chorus, or, and uh, then Mr. Wright would read Thoreau or Emerson or something he was reading, and then he would talk about something. And that night, one night, while Junior is an apprentice, his folks are there, and he starts to talk about the city of the future. And there's an exhibition that's going to be in New York, and and uh, all all about manufacturing and this and that. And he's been asked to do some work there and do a model. And he said, if I had the money, I would be I'd love to do that. And Kaufman Sr. said, how much money do you need? And Mr. Wright said, I need $1,000. Well, that's like 10000 or 12000 today. And Kaufman said, you can start tomorrow. And the next morning, I was in the drafting room. Kaufman came in to say goodbye and thank him. And he put a check down for $500. And we started. Mr. Wright, with that $500, he bought a new truck down payment, of course, a lot of plywood, and we started to work on it. It was later that he would, he kept inviting people up, and uh, maybe a year later or so, that he invited up some friends of his from Chicago. They were, it turned out, they were all art directors, and Johnson had, had, had a local architect design a building for his site here, and he went down to Chicago, and he went to that very advertising agency where one of these people worked, and he went to see this man who had been a Taliesin. To, there were to be three niches on each side of the entrance, and the niche, he wanted for these niches uh, Somebody, a lady polishing a table, someone waxing a floor, all these, you know, these silly things. And this man looked at him and he said, you don't need an artist for these bar reliefs. You need an architect. And last week I was up there and Frank Lloyd Wright showed us around and he's got, he's got a bunch of fellows and they're turning out work and you ought to see him. And Johnson made arrangements and that's how we got that job. The architect was fired. <laughs> So here is Racine, and this is a company very, very similar to the Larkin Company. The neighborhood was terrible. These are individual houses, a movie house, uh, a grocery store, another couple of houses, and then the Johnson Wax Company comes from there. And on this corner was um, a building that had been a bar and grill with a floor above Johnson's own it. And this is the plan of the building. And every... 20 feet is the center of a column. And uh, you enter in the rear. You don't enter in the front. These are air conditioned. These are the breathers. He called them the nostrils. 
So we made first the preliminary drawings, and I drove Mr. Wright down to Racine, first to meet Johnson, and the next time, and meet the people, and the next vi visit we went to, oh, let me tell you this one. We're having lunch with Johnson, just the three of us. I'm 25 years old, I guess. And uh, Johnson said, uh, Mr. Wright, also called him Mr. Wright, Mr. Wright, after lunch, I want to take you over to the plant, and I want you to meet all the heads of the departments. And if you would, just ask each one in a general way what he wants, and then put it in your mind, but don't pay any attention to them, because most of those people won't be here when we finish the building. And most of them weren't. So anyway, uh, we made the preliminary drawings. And see, this is the perspective. And this shows the main building. And this shows it from the street. You drive your car in, you park, and you go in, go to work. And the drawing that I made, he had me make a drawing where you cut the back of it apart so that you could see the, col the big columns. And you could see the rest of the, how the whole whole thing works. We had a real problem because there had never been a column of this nature. And there was no way that the, that the uh, calculations could be checked. And Mr. Wright got a building permit, only would get a building permit only if, if we uh, loaded a column to, 20 ton to 12 tons. We made this column. Uh, it was cured for 28 days. And then uh, sto uh, the uh, uh, sandbags were put around. And we got up to the third sandbag. We got to the 12 tons. And everybody said, well, what do you want to do? Mr. Wright said, come on, put on more sandbags, which we did. And then they said, what do you want? What do we do now? And uh, when we got 62 tons, this is all cast iron. That is when we just, Mr. Wright, someone said, well, what do we do now? He said, well, pull out one of these props, get a bulldozer and a long rope. And he looked up at it. There he is looking at the column. And then when it got pulled, I took this shot. Boom, it came down. That hit so hard that it broke a lead pipe, not a cast iron pipe that was 10 feet below. There was, and then we had a drafting room there, and I would come down Monday and say till Friday or Thursday. One day, Mr. Wright, uh, Mr. Johnson came in and he wrote, Mr. Wright authorized Edgar Taffel first and Wesley Peters second to be in charge or stay while Mr. Wright's in Arizona. Johnson had a way. Then he later on, he put on, uh, Mr. Wright came back. And he wrote on, it's all out of focus, I took it bad. It says, Mr. Wright promised to be here uh, when he was here on May 13th that uh, he would come back once a week thereafter. And Johnson signed it. And then on chalk, Mr. Wright signed under it. Strange way to have a document. Now the building is finished. Almost two years later, there is no cornice. It's all glass, glass tubing. And under the balcony all around is another glass tubing. The landscaping isn't the way nature would do it. This is in the city. This is one variety. This is another. This is another. That's the entrance. There were 36 different radii of brick, inside and outside brick. And as you enter, he redesigned the revolving door. And that's the great space. When you're in this room, you know that the sun comes along and goes one way to another. You know when it gets dark. Uh, we designed all the furniture. Johnson owned part of a, of a flooring company that made rubber flooring. And the uh, desktops were designed in, in white oak. And I was there a couple of years ago and visited with the, uh, and the, the facilities manager and I went around and I saw, I said, my colleagues, what, what's happened? You have carpet all over the place. He said, we got goddamn tired of waxing that floor. <laughs> the same thing with the tabletops. He said, we got tired of them. That's all for Micah. I think we go to the next rack here. 
Any questions? He loved to draw. At this time, 37, Town and Country asked him to design a cover for them. And he took, it was July, and this is July 4th celebration on the American flag. At that time, a very interesting thing happened, and I'll do it as quickly as I can. I was down in Chicago supervising something or other, and uh, somebody told me that Meyer Levin uh, was there, and I had known Meyer Levin when I worked at a summer adult camp. He was a puppeteer, and uh, he had he was also a writer. He grew up in Chicago, went to the University of Illinois, and uh, he had just come back from Spain. He was writing about the war there, and I got in touch with him, and uh, we visited and had dinner, and I told him what he was doing, and he said, gee, I'd like to write a story about Frank Lloyd Wright. Will you introduce me? Which I did. And uh, he wrote it for Coronet Magazine, 1937. And that's when this shot was taken. We call that the Dracula shot. <laughs> and that's the, that's the, the uh, uh, Broadacre City model, which you'll see if you go to MoMA. A few days right soon after this, Mr. Wright got a letter from a, a man in Great Neck, Long Island, wherever that is, saying that, he had read this article, and he bought a piece of land and would Mr. Wright. And he took, first told all about, he, he honored Mr. Wright all the way through. P.S., well, my wife and I bought a piece of land, and uh, we uh, would wonder if you would, would be so kind as to design a building for us. And Mr. Wright came to New York, met the Rabunes, and uh, came back with a, master pl with a plan of the site. That's the Dracula shot in its reality. And this is the Rabune House in Great Neck, the very preliminary that was done. There was a road came around here. You drove in. There was a carport over here, a row of columns. And you come into the house, and there's a dining area up here a little higher because the kitchen is up higher on that level. And the living room was L-shaped here. And uh, there was a tree. There were two trees here. And they would come out into the dining room. Mr. Wright got out of plans of a house that he had done in Oak Park many years before, and the other people at Taliesin didn't want to work on it, on this house. They said it was... So, anyway, I hung around, and I hung around in the drafting room, and I made a perspective. Then from this perspective and from this drawing, colored drawings were made with ink as well. Then when they were made, it was near Christmas time, Mr. Wright said, uh, Edgar, take the drawings to New York on where you're going for Christmas and present them to the client, which was just fantastic for me to do. And I did, and this is how the house got built. Um, I'm not, let's see how the time is running. Oh my God. <laughs> Pardon? Well, we, um, we're nearing the end, but I must say, I wrote to Mr. Wright, uh, my folks were in the dress business and they had a secretary. So I would go in and I would bang out a letter and then I'd give it to the secretary, fortunately, and she would put it into in English and all that sort of thing. I was brought up in a progressive school background where we were never learned, we never learned to spell. Uh, anyway, I wrote this letter to Mr. Wright and, and, uh, I just got to read a few things for, uh, dear Mr. Wright, it took several days before I could get together with the Rabunes. Last night we drove to Great Neck. I stayed over. There was no need to sell the plan. You had already convinced them. To say they are enthusiastic is being mild. Mr. Wright, Mr. Rabune got to understand the plans through the perspectives. Because most people can't read plans anyway or elevations. And then it, I go on and on. Um, they know little about construction. When I suggested the dining room might be retained and wall taken away, Mrs. Ray Rayburn protested. She would have the two trees in the house 
with the skylight above. If she worked day and night, she was a dress designer to raise the money. It seems they could manage 20,000. Mrs. Rabune designs dresses for one of the most successful dress houses in the city. Mr. Rabune is all for going ahead. They will go the limit. Well, they sure did go the limit. Um, anyway, I tell one thing and another, and we went, came back and made the working drawings, and we got the building going and finished. We'll jump now. This is the, his schematic drawing for the synagogue in, in Philadelphia. He would be the one, not his draftsman, not a hired hand. When Very often when you see the name of three people in an architectural firm, one is the job getter, the other is the designer, and the other, other one turns out and makes it all work. Uh, very often they have a design staff. I worked for a big firm in Chicago after I left Mr. Wright, and they would have me design I was a designer. I would design three or four elevations for the plan. The boss would come along with the other boss, and they would like this part here, that part there, that part there, and then you'd put them all together, and it's spelled baloney, you know. So, but not Mr. Wright. He was in charge of design from the very first moment till the very end. He was also in charge of changing everything. So this is a drawing made, a night drawing. And when this was done, Alan Davidson was a a, 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 an apprentice, and he did a lot of night shots. And this is an actual shot of the, of the temple, the synagogue. This is all plastic, and it gives a luminous quality through it. This is um, a Unitarian church in Madison, Wisconsin, that Mr. I designed. And, uh, It look, look how close it is from the perspective to the reality. From it. He put the choir up on a balcony, which is, I've done some 35 religious works, and it's very interesting as to where, in, in, uh, the, where the, the choir goes. And I didn't say that it's Christian or Jewish. Uh, I've done five temples, and uh, one, the choir is is sunken deep because the choir is a Boughton choir, like a Boughton rendering. There are blacks and Catholics and all that, so you, it really be confusing. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I think if, it's, oh, and I did it, well, my first church was down in lower Manhattan, and I was told the choir's got to be there because if we're not there, the boys and girls won't, they won't sing unless they're seen. Lutherans have theirs way up in the back. Almost always, the choir is not seen. How do we get onto that? This is um, a house in Scotts in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and Bob Mosier, one of the three of us, did this rendering. And it was done in the, very much the style of the, the thing was done similar to Taliesin West, redwood and desert stone. And this is how the building ended. Very handsome building. Bob uh, came back to Arizona, stayed in Arizona and got married there. And the day after his wedding, he uh, wanted to show his wife the house, and he had a camera, and he went and drove out with her, and this is what Bob saw. The house had burned the night before. If I hope you can see it. Uh, you know, these bright lights are what now he tells us. Can you see? That's a section through the Guggenheim. This is the open part. And that is one of the renderings that Mr. Wright made. That same Alan Davidson did that one. And you can see that Wright had put a building behind, maybe not the way it was. And there's the building completed. I, uh, oh, about 10 years ago or so, Wes Peters and I were in London, and we gave a lecture with my slides, strangely, and we used most of this to the Royal Institute of British Architects. And uh, I showed this 
this very uh, slide, and someone in the audience said, uh, in, in his own language, uh, Mr. Peters, uh, uh, may I ask you a question? West said, yes, sir, go right ahead. He said, um, that skylight looks rather, the design looks uh, rather unresolved. What do you think about it? Uh, West said, well, sir, uh, Mr. Wright made six or seven designs, and he wasn't happy with any of them. And at the last minute, one day, George Cohn, the contractor, called and said, Mr. Wright, now, you've got to tell me immediately which design you want, because we're to that point. Mr. Wright said, well, George, take the last one. So that's what happened. <laughs> that's how decisions are made. The red square. George asked Mr. Wright if he couldn't have the name of his company, Euclid Contracting Company, on uh, on the cornerstone. Mr. Wright said, George, a round building does not have a cornerstone. <laughs> However, he said, when the building is finished, my name will be there as architect and your name as the builder. Because after we are gone, nobody will know the name of a company like Euclid. And that's what Mr. Wright did, just FLLW. Architect George N. Cohen Builder. These, this is a drawing of Florida Southern College, one of the buildings there. And this is a completed building. Incidentally, this is near Orlando, and the college has made this into a museum. It's going to be a Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright Museum. And this is the chapel that was originally designed. It had four flower boxes or growth boxes in it, but when the building got built, they had to be cut down in order to fit the ball. There are only three, one, two, three. That's the interior of the chapel. Oh, the choir, it's up here. This is a Methodist school. This is the last photograph of Frank Lloyd Wright. He was almost 92. He died in Phoenix, and Wes Peters and two other apprentices drove the body in a station wagon all the way back to Taliesin for the burial. We came from all over the country. Mr. Wright's body was put on the back of a wagon, and Wes Peters, his son-in-law, drove the wagon, and Mrs. Wright and the family Walked, walked behind, and then the apprentices and us friends. We walked across the valley to the family chapel, which he had worked on as a boy when he's in his teens, coming out for the summer. The stones are the Wrights and the Joneses. <coughs> Sometime after the burial, Mrs. Wright chose a stone from the quarry. And that no was not touched. To the right of that is a marker that she had one of the apprentices design in stained glass, and the inscription above his name says, the love of an idea is the love of God. I've given this talk before, and I often have turned, it, turned that out of focus. But recently, I acquired a photograph that Tony Vaccaro did of Mr. Wright in the mid-50s, and I thought this would be much more fitting. And that's how I think about the man. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I think we have time for a few brief questions. And uh, if there are any, I'll repeat the questions so everyone can hear. Speak loudly. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Broad Acres. Uh, Edgar? Uh, futurist. The uh, woman is asking about uh, so, uh, future, futuristic city. I really don't like the word futuristic because it reminds me of more comic books than, uh, but Edgar, why don't you respond? Uh, Wright was born, I just said right, in 1867. 
And you can see that, I mean, the, the lifestyle that he had and what happened in this country all the way through those periods. Uh, the electricity f came just after the turn of century. The automobile became a part of the household and the automobile freed the people to, this, to the country. And he wanted to show how to live in the country where everyone who wanted would have a minimum of an acre of land, he would have a pl an automobile, he could drive to the station, and he had all kinds of things. That, and uh, that's why he made that Broadacre City model. Pardon? It's sort of. There are many. There are many, but there there are not any of them quite like it. He also designed a highway that went along it. There was one other thing that he did, which many of the uh, architectural professors never ask. They never ask anybody who was there. That's the strangest thing. And I was at a presentation um, in in Princeton where this professor got up and talked all about Broadacre City, this and all that and so on, and he said, right put these buildings in judicious and well-planned spots and this and that. And, uh, I, and I, somebody said, Edgar, you know that's not so. So I said, uh, by the way, I said, by the way, I was there. He had us design five identical uh, uh, residential apartment houses. And when they were finished, he walked around, he dropped one here, and he <laughs> dropped one there. And he dropped. <laughs> so this, um, I said, in, in sort of a fury, I said, I've just completed a book and I think you ought to read it. And he said, uh, Mr. Chaffel, I have read it. And I said, well, then read it again. And I left. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Could, could I respond to that? Because it's an interesting story. The gentleman is asking that the, as, as the years progressed, that the stained glass windows that Mr. Wright designed became simpler, less complex. Oh. Well, Edgar, why don't you? I think, his, I think his last stained glass building was 1923 for the Barnsdall House in, uh, in, in Los Angeles. No, I think he began to feel it was old fashioned. But uh, it really wasn't wanted. He didn't have it in his own home. In his own home, um, the windows that got in closer to the corners, he had little wooden mullions to, to sort of strengthen it up. But uh, we, uh, who had to wash the windows ourselves, decided that we, when we had our own homes, we would have one sheet of glass and just well, clean it. But that's a very good question. I think that he first did a lot of stained glass because he did these big expanses of glass, and he didn't want people to have dra big draperies in front of them all the time or something like that. But I showed you those others in the, the house in uh, Buffalo, and you just couldn't see through. Yes, he did. He did. I'm trying to think of uh, what other churches he did, whether he did the stained glass, did stained glass in them. Yeah. Any other, I, I was only going to mention about stained glass. When the Metropolitan Museum bought the little house, they, made, they bought it for a very small sum of money, and they installed it for a relatively small sum of money, and they had lots of stained glass windows. And they put most of those stained glass windows on the markets, public knowledge it appeared in the auction houses and sold to other museums. And they made about 20, 30 times the price that they had paid to assemble it and purchase it in the sale of the stained glass windows, which just escalated in value. Extraordinary story, very good investment. Any other questions? It's getting late, it's about five minutes to 10. One more question from the lady in the rear. Oh, Edgar could ask, answer that. Edgar? The, the, the young woman in the back is asking where the glass, the stained glass was made. Was it Chicago? Oh, uh, mostly in Chicago. I forget the name of the firm that made it. Um, it. Very interesting. When we were in Buffalo, we were there in 1937 or six, and that house had been built in 1934. And uh, he, we asked the same question, who made the stained glass? Because that glass had, had bronze and very thin mullions, which are called canes. And uh, one other thing, then I saw that chair, which was what he called the barrel chair. 
And um, I said, Mr. Wright, we ought, we ought to make some of those. Where, can, where could we, uh, who made them? He said, the Matthews Brothers from Milwaukee. Oh, he remembered for 30, over 30 years, who was the contractor. I went to that company, I got the original plans, and I brought them back to him. What do you know? He changed them. Instead of the back having a curve, he made it straight. And now that's the one that's being made and sold all over the place. It's terribly uncomfortable. I had some copied for myself. They are comfortable. What? Oh, I just, uh, thank you, Edgar. Yeah. I just wanted to note, and Bacha has reminded me, that Edgar will be visiting Falling Water in Chicago oh. on the, uh, no, Chicago. Is it Chicago? Falling Water, I'm sorry. Edgar will be visiting Falling Water on a Y-sponsored tour on the 22nd of March. April, April. April. We'll get it right. Uh, the 22nd of April, uh, and there were brochures in the outer lobby outside the auditorium. I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. And Edgar. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.